Welcome back to Make Way for Cat. I played 27 games on this channel in 2022, and I'm going to recap all of them for you in rapid fire reviews with tier standings. So here we go. No Place Like Home was early access when I first played it at the start of this year. I enjoyed the cleaning simulator aspect of it, but struggled with motion sickness for the first time ever in a game. I don't have any desire to play this one again, so it's getting a C. Ocean's Heart is a top-down pixel adventure in the same vein as A Link to the Past. Dungeons were fun, the story was great, and it's a must if you're a Zelda fan, so I'm giving it a B. I remember finishing Strange Horticulture and thinking, I know it's January, but I know this game will be in my top games for the year. Now we're here, and it's an absolute standout. A perfect mix of horticulture sim and puzzle game with a creepy story and multiple endings. Some find the cataloging and labeling frustrating, but I really liked it. This is my first S tier of the year, and I can't rave enough about this game. Pokemon Legends Arceus felt like the first Pokemon game designed for us adults who grew up with Pokemon from the beginning. From sneaking around and catching Pokemon in the overworld, the fun story, and nods to previous games, I had a blast from start to finish. Plus, this game holds one of my favorite memories of the year, beating Giratina with my shiny Psyduck giving this one an A for the first Pokemon game I've finished since X and Y. Brookhaven Grimoire looked like a super promising dark fantasy bent Stardew Valley. It could have easily been an S tier game. It delivered on story but failed in quality of life. My game bugged and I wasn't able to open the last area in the Unwritten Lands. I'm sure a ton of stuff has been fixed by now and despite the issues, I still sunk a lot of time into this game. So I'll give this one a B. Core Keeper was a fun little jaunt into my Terraria nostalgia, but it feels like a game built specifically for multiplayer, which I don't typically play, and really, I just wanted to play more Terraria. I'm giving this one a C. The premise and the story were there, but it just isn't for me. Calico was cute, but it was very short. It didn't offer a lot, and the art style wasn't my favorite. It was weird in a lot of the best ways, but there wasn't a lot of content, so I have to give this one a C. Lost Nova was a short and sweet puzzle adventure with a cute story. I don't have any glaring negatives from this game. It's a cozy game worth the play, so I'm gonna give it a B. Dragon Cafe is part logic game and part baking sim. The hand-drawn art style and puzzle questing were nice, but the baking aspect was a repetitive chore. I did like this game, but some of the puzzles were tough even for me, and while I'd normally 100% a game like this, I gave up when I finished the story. For that, I'm going to give it a C and a half. Little Witch in the Woods has interesting characters, gorgeous art style, and a puzzle style potion making progression that unravels a good story. I didn't want to stop playing, but unfortunately the game stopped on its own abruptly, as it's early access. It could have been an S tier for me if it was done, but I'm giving it an A because I do want more of it immediately. Sunhaven is an early access fantasy sim that went through major content and gameplay updates this year. Though I only played a fraction of those updates, I can see the game is going to be an absolute smash when it finally releases in 1.0. I can't wait to do an entirely new playthrough once this releases, so for that I'm going to give it an A. For Rune Factory 5, I just wish it was more like Rune Factory 4. The marriage system was based too much on RNG, farming was too complex for my taste, there was too much space in the town, and I just found myself forcing my way through the last half of it. Good story though, but not enough for me to go back, so I'm giving this a C. Apico is a chill bee breeding sim with more complex requirements for breeding new bees the further you get in. It got too tedious for me to finish, but it may be enjoyable for those who like that kind of challenge. They also recently added butterflies. I did enjoy this while I played it, so I'm going to give it a B. Pun intended. My Time at Sandrock is a lot better than its predecessor, My Time at Portia, in story and in gameplay. While still in early access, it's already had at least two major content updates surrounding the most interesting character, Logan. This game is an example of how to do early access correctly. I just wish I had more time to play it. Because there's still a lot missing in this game, I'm going to give this one an A. Spirit of the Island is an early access survival style farming sim that fell incredibly flat for me. The story was too short and underwhelming, the gameplay is underwhelming, and the content patches are small and also underwhelming. I have no plans to go back, so I'm giving it a C. 
time on Frog Island played like the item exchange quest chain from Ocarina of Time, but there were no words, no map, no directions, and no clues. Because of that, it was no fun, and I returned it. My only absolute F this year. Dinkum took over my entire channel in August this year, and it was addicting from the very beginning. It's still in early access, and I look forward to more content updates. S tier for sure. Ooblitz is a Pokemon meets card-based dance battle farming sim, and I enjoyed my time in it. It flopped on my channel, so I continued to play it offline. I've lost my taste for card games since my college Magic the Gathering days, but this felt less like a card game and more like a strategy game that doesn't take itself too seriously. I also love the exploration, the customization, and the overall humor and art style. Plus, finding shiny Ooblets feels just as rewarding as finding shiny Pokemon without the hassle of farming spawns over and over, so that's why I'm giving this game an A. Disney Dreamlight Valley is Disney's take on Animal Crossing, and it is delightful. The quests are fun, I enjoy customizing the town, and myself. Weirdly, unlike Animal Crossing, designing interiors isn't that fun for me. I don't find much replayability between new content, but so far there's been big content updates every month. And even the Starlight Path events generate enough content with fun rewards to warrant sticking around for a while. Even though this game is early access, it actually feels like mini expansions rather than core game updates. That's why I'm giving this game an S because it's easy to pick up again after being away for some time, and the updates are consistent and great. Potion Permit, despite some game control flaws, played like a perfect potion making sim for me. I love the doctor mechanic, the puzzle solving potion brewing, and the little stories from all the NPCs. I 100%ed this game in about 25 hours and enjoyed every minute of it. When I wasn't playing it, I thought about playing it. For that reason, I'm giving it an S. Coral Island came out in early access with a lot of anticipation back in October. There wasn't a lot of game to play, but what was there is stunning. Despite the need for a ton of quality of life adjustments, there's a good story brewing with all the farming sim activities you've come to love in these types of games. I can't wait for more. I'm giving it an A for now, but I could see this as an S tier game later on in development. Lonesome Village is a super cute puzzle game with an unabashed love for the Zelda franchise. Short but fun to play, I give this one an A. I really wanted to like Potionomics. 2022 was the year I realized that I hold a special place for potion making sims. I love the characters in this game, the mystery of the uncle's death, and even the potion competitions. The time constraint is what killed it for me. The looming deadline made me feel like I was rushing a process to perfect potions I didn't even know how to make yet. For that, I'm giving it a C. A Little to the Left started as a sweet, relaxing puzzle game and ended with several rage quits. It was very short, and some of the later puzzles felt arbitrary, like the correct position of a sandwich crumb. I finished it because I felt like I had to, but I had to look up all the rest of the answers, and for that reason I'm giving it a C. Blue Oak Bridge had a rocky first day with control issues, but a quick patch made it playable. Since then, I'm enjoying the opening quests and a promising storyline. This one is an early access, and I'm not going to count it out yet. I'll be continuing this adventure at some point, and for that reason, it gets a B for now. I find it tough to review Pokemon Scarlet because I'm a casual player. I enjoyed the quests, the gyms, the Team Star bases, but just like every other mainline game since X and Y, I didn't finish it. It's definitely not as good as Legends Arceus, so I'm giving it a B. In early access, Kinseed seemed too complicated for me, so I never played it. I tried it out for 1.0, and I am obsessed. It feels slow in the reputation grind, but between the quests, the NPC stories, building a blacksmith empire, and picking out a spouse, the game is packed and played completely at your own discretion and pace. I love this game, and it's the final game I've played this year. It's a solid S. So what's my game of the year? You might think it's Kinseed because it's consumed my entire December on my channel, but it's actually... Dinkum! I was obsessed with this game, and even in early access it has so much to offer. The terraforming and village building, uncovering treasures in the mine, completing the collections, every ounce of this game is a blast. What was your game of the year? Did you agree with my rankings? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.